I'm saxophonist Keith Loftus, and welcome to the fourth episode of Coffee with Loftus. I'm really excited to sit down with one of my mentors, master drummer, educator, and golfer, the one and only Mr. Michael Carvin. So sit back, grab your coffee or tea, and enjoy. Michael Carvin, thank you so much for coming on for the fourth episode of Coffee with Loftus. Man, it's a pleasure. Thank you, man. Thank you. How you been? I've been good. I've been All good. All right. And how's family? The how's family, family? The family is good. How about All you? All right. Please say hello to your beautiful mom and your brother and your sister. Will do. Will do. Will do. Okay. And but how's your beautiful bride? She how's is she good. doing? That's she's, Sagittarius. She's good. She's doing very good. She's um, been Okay. Teaching. Just tell her, make sure don't be moving her birthday now. Leave it <laughs> on the 11th. Don't be, be, be she, Leave it. Her and her sister, just leave your birthday on the 11th and eat your cake. Don't, 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 don't be like waiting to midnight and all that. <laughs> got it, got it. Because then she'll be crowding my space. <laughs> <laughs> well, my first question, <laughs> my first question is, how have you been doing during this pandemic? Oh, fantastic, man. Because, yeah. you know, uh, just like everybody else, just staying in and uh, developing, yep. developing. Like, uh, we accomplished a lot of things, like um, just just clean the head out, improving the concentration. Uh, you know me, Keith, I'm a dream. I dream a lot during the day. I just, you, you know, it's so beautiful. One of the views that we have here in Woodland Hills, California, we can just see the mountains. There's no buildings. We can just look right out the window and just beautiful. beautiful. So, so once I start in the middle of the mountain and I look at that, and then I slowly look at the top, and then I hit infinity mm. with the sky. Mm -hmm. And that's what I remember about. Texas, man. When I was a kid, I, I would lay in the backyard at night on my back, and I would just look at the stars. The stars were as uh, uh, large as uh, wide open spaces, uh, condos and stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, when I first moved here, when I was 18 in 1963, coming from Texas, everything is flat. I was fascinated by the mountains, and I still am. I just like them. I don't want to yeah. climb them or none of that. I just, I just want to admire them. Yeah. Um, my beautiful bride and I played golf on yesterday, and we played in uh, Burbank, California. It was our first time playing this course, The Bell. That was the name of that course. Mm. And the mountains was like, you could touch them. I mean, it was like, I, I mean, it, it's just beautiful, man. I mean, for me, a lot of people, I don't know, but I just like it. Yep. Because when I look at a mountain, the highest peak was the top of the earth at one time. It had to be. Mm. For one reason. Mountains don't grow, Keith. <laughs> true. 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 Wow. Oh, what you doing? I'm watering my mountain. Mm. It should be, it should be, it should be growing pretty fast soon. You, you know, this is not really the season to plant the mountain, but we, we started. The mountains don't grow, sir. Wow. So, Michael, <laughs> my the yeah. next question is, your experience growing up in Texas, how did how, how did you come to music and the drums? I mean, did you come up oh. in a family or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Henry Carbon Sr., my father, was a great drummer and a great entrepreneur. You know, he owned, uh, well, he, he worked with, a lot of the guys, uh, and one of his bands, Chew Berry was in the band, and wow. he worked with uh, Louis Armstrong, and he, he and Illinois Jacket, and Russell Jacket, and Annette Cobb, and wow. uh, Alex Sample. They grew up together. Wow. Alex Sample is Joe Sample's oldest brother. Mm. Alex used to play a piano in one of my father's bands, so my mother would tell the story. When I was four years old, she said, I was standing in front of the radio and dance and it wouldn't be on. You, you just heard it. It was in you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's you, you know me, we, we, we've been uh, uh, 
together for a while. Mm -hmm. I hear music. Yep. And I hear it all the time. Mm. And you know, with that great band, we had like, you guys were so kind enough to have patience with me <laughs> because I'm going to hear it. <laughs> I'm going to hear it. it, it I'm going to be, uh, because it's going to come to me. So then at, at, at six, I, I started playing drums and, you know, um, I always wanted to be in a marching band, man. I never wanted to play in no jazz band. I mean, I really did, man. I'm from Texas, man. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be in the marching band with the cheerleaders and the major rets, man. I didn't want to be with a, a bunch of hard heads, man. Yeah. I wanted to be in the marching band. Then I fell in love with John Philip Sousa. Mm. Oh, yeah, I love John Philip Sousa, man. You see, a lot of guys, they be talking about, see, what, what guys be talking about jazz or heavy metal or whatever it is, those, those various um, uh, genres, man. Mm -hmm. Everything is inside of John Philip Sousa. Mm. If you can hear it, if you can hear it, Everything okay. is right. Check this out. Yeah. That's John Philip, man. So oh. when I started hearing John Philip, because my father was would always be rehearsing in the house with his band, so I could hear the jazz. And as a teenager in the street, we were playing R&B. Mm. But it was something about when football season came, man. And you'd be in the stadium, because you know we played in Jefferson Stadium. We didn't play in a high school stadium like they do everywhere else. See, in, in, um, in the late 50s and early 60s, the only uh city in the state of Texas that had professional anything was your hometown, Dallas. Dallas was the only city in the state of Texas, man. But you know, during, uh, during that time, people from Houston and Dallas, they didn't mix because it's different tribes. Yeah. Yeah. It still might be that yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, I think it's better now. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> Boy, we would come across that bridge into Dallas to play Phyllis Wheeling High School. Wow. And if we won the game, we would lose the fight. And if we lost the game, we would lose the game and the fight. Uh, you know? <laughs> wow. Because during that time, there was only one way in and one way out. And they would have the rocks setting right at the bridge. And we come through, they would rock wow. out the school buses, man. Wow. Dallas wow. boys. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you know, um, I started playing when, when, when I was six. And just growing up, man, uh, Louis Armstrong and all these people used to come by the house because keep in mind, it was segregated then. Mm. So my parents would deposit uh, the three of us, my two brothers and I, at, at Grandma and Grandpa Ben's house and and the guys on the road would take our beds. Mm, wow. So I grew up in show business, plus Uncle Roby with Peacock Records. So I saw Bobby Blue Bland. I saw, uh, um, um, what's the name? Defrost, Abba Defrost Collins, man. Mm. Yeah, yeah, man. I saw that, man. Yeah, Albert D. Frost Collins now, because that was his first hit. His first hit was D. Frost. Wow. So his name was Albert D. Frost Collins, and I met every slam, whatever, a, a guitar slam, item board slam, a, a extension card <laughs> slam. No, no, because that was, if you played guitar out of tune with a clamp on the end of the neck, and you sang out of tune, see, if you... Just put slam on it and you working. Wow. I'm out of tune slam. Okay, it's back. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't think I ever met the original guitar slam. Every, hey, man, what's your, hey, man, I'm guitar slam from a man. You, you got a beat there? I'd say, yeah, okay, play your beat. Yeah. 
Wow. I worked with a guy and uh, he was Iron Boy Slim and a tenor player. It was guitar, tenor, and drums, yeah, no bass. And mm. he would just, he had he had one string with a clamp on it. One string on one his string. guitar with a <laughs> clamp on it. Wow. <laughs> and then he would say, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna do another song for you. We just up down, play that back beat drum and boom, and boom, ding, 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 People, man, and, mm. and this little joint would be off the road, back in the woods with a, a, a red light, one red light. Mm. That's it. Wow. It had sawdust on the floor, and they took three barrels and put some plywood on it. That's the bar, man. These wow. are hard working people, man. Wow. wow. But it would be packed, and on the porch, the screen door was half kicked out. And it had the white light, and you could see a thousand Texas mosquitoes. <laughs> so as soon as you hit the porch, they say, hey, how you doing? Yeah. Uh, how's your yeah. blood supply? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Michael, what, uh, what, it, how, how, I mean, you've played with, like, everybody. Dizzy, Freddie Hubbard, the great trio, Dakota Stanton. Um, Bobby Womack, and I think you told me a while ago that you that you did some work with a uh, with Motown as well. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, where when did you make that transition from Texas and your journey to New York, and you know, getting an opportunity to to work with? Well, you see, you see speaking of Bobby Womack, I love Bobby Womack, me man. Too. The Womack brothers, me it too. was Bobby, Harry, Curtis. And um, what was the other one's name? It was Bobby Womack, Harry Womack, Curtis, and um, the other brother come. But, but see, Harry and I was tight. You know that song, Harry Hippie? Uh-huh. That was written for Harry Womack. Ah. Uh -huh. Harry Womack was the first guy that I saw with a Beatle process before I saw the Beatles. Huh. Harry, man, uh, that was my man. He uh, he died very young, unfortunately. But see, we were Sam Cook's opening act, man. Wow. Yeah, because Sam and Bobby were tight. Huh. See, because Bobby wrote that first hit uh, that the Rolling Stones uh, covered. And Sam, Bobby didn't want to do it. You know, and 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 he's hollering and screaming because Bobby's from Cleveland, so it, it, he's he's hollering and screaming. And Sam is like, "But you get the mechanicals, man." And Bobby's like, I, "He didn't know what Sam was talking about." Right. So Sam Sam said, "Just trust me." <laughs> and Bobby told when that first check came in, he said, "Would they like some more songs?" Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, said, exactly. <laughs> You know, you know, what they like some more. So, <laughs> so, so what happened? Uh, my father and I made a list when uh, I was fifteen, and I was very fortunate because I've always known what I wanted, how to get it, and when I wanted it. I wanted to develop. That's very important to develop. So I did that whole rudimental thing. The only reason why I uh, came to Los Angeles, California, to live, it was to live my father's dream to be a studio drummer because he couldn't get that chance in Houston, Texas. So I came to California. I made that dream come true. I did a lot of studio work. Just go in and sight read. Mm -hmm. And I did the Barbara McNair TV show, and that's when I used to fly my parents out, and they would see their youngest son play the TV show with 32 pieces, and that's that was my father's dream. That's why he really pushed sight reading. Now, one day, 
doing the TV show that was a violinist. He was maybe 60 or 70 and he had all white hair and he would always come early. And I would be early because uh, Cobra's Taylor Perkinson uh, gave me a double. He made me the librarian of the uh, Bobby McNair TV show so I could get a double with the u- union so I could mm. get drums and uh, uh, that. So I would come early and, and Coleridge would give me the charge. I'd put all the books on, on the stand, you know. And uh, this, this violinist, for some reason, I've, I've watched him for almost a year, but for some reason, he spoke to me. So I was behind him because the strings were down front. The, uh, the, uh, the rhythm section is in the back. And um, I'm looking at him from the back of his head, and he's telling me, he said, look, Carvin, as young as you are, you should go to New York mm. because you can come back to L.A. and do this because you're already in. He said, so don't do what I did uh. and get stuck here. And I swear he said, he said that to me. Mm. Would I turn around and would I speak? And so... I said, okay. And, and Frank Strozier was in the band. So uh, Frank, I used to talk to Frank a lot. So Frank said, man, after the Bob, Bob McNair TV show, I'm going to New York. I said, oh, okay. And Strozier said, if you ever come through, call me. I said, okay. So he split. So I finished the show. Then I joined Hampton Halls wow. trio with uh, Charlie Hayden. But wow. Charlie uh, was a little under the weather during that time. So Ham told me to uh, find a bass player. So I brought Henry Franklin. That was uh, my roommate. And we went to Europe uh, for three months. We got there June the 15th. We left September the 15th. We made six records that came out after Ham died in 86. Mm-hmm. But what I saw with the jazz community was disturbing because I was used to uh, green rooms and with uh, all of those acts, we wore tuxedos, man. You, you, you know, with the blue ruffle shirts. <laughs> and uh, we had the coat, uh, like uh, uh, the suits, the young men are wearing today. Uh-huh. The fitted suits with the short courts. Yep. That's what we were wearing in the 50s and the 60s, man. Yeah. Wow. So, so the cut it, the coat is cut short, so the cuff link will show. Yeah. But I watch these guys today wearing that suit, but they don't have cuff links. The only reason why they cut the short, the uh, the sleeve on the coat short was so the cuff for the shirt and the cuff links would show. So you have your monogram. The guys are not wearing hand. I don't know what they're doing, but it doesn't matter. And um, the music was great, but the lifestyle was a little strange Mm. for me at that time. So I came back to L.A. and I moved to San Francisco. Why did I move to San Francisco? I moved to San Francisco because I had never lived in a city as a drummer. Houston, Texas, I had a car. L.A., I had a car. So I moved to San Francisco so I could learn how to get through a city without a car because Mm -hmm. I hadn't learned how to do that. So um, I got that together. Freddie Hubbard had a hit record, Intrepid Fox. In 1962, Freddie Hubbard was hotter than Miles Davis. And my father told me, he said, Michael, when you go to New York, be with the hottest band come into New York so everybody will pay to come to meet you instead of you going around the club, the club saying, my name is Michael Carvin, I play drums, can I set in? Mm. He said, make everybody come to you. See, that's the advantage of being second generation anything. You have the inside knowledge on how to uh, be successful, how to move. So um, Freddie came to the boat band, which Delano Dean, the owner of the boat band, uh, was a very good friend of mine because I live right around the corner from that club. And one day I passed by, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon, and I saw 
uh, it was on the street level, and Delano Dean was taking the glasses off and the, uh, the ashtrays for those who don't know what ashtray is, does we put cigarettes in. <laughs> and and um, <laughs> leave me alone, Keith. And, 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 and he was cleaning up and wiping the bar. So I tapped on the window, and he did like close. And I tapped on the window, he's closed. And I tapped on the window, he's closed. <laughs> and he's like, so he, he opened the door, and I said, Look, man, just give me a minute. My name is Michael Carvin. I'm preparing to go to New York. The only jazz names I know are the superstars. You, I've been in your club a many night and you be playing some records and I don't know who's playing on them. And he said, yeah, man, I, I have the greatest record collection. I said, look, I will come and sweep the floor and wash the glasses and, and clean the club every day. If you play some of those records to turn me on, to the New York jazz community because mm. I don't know anything about it. And once I said that to him, he really kind of took me in. Mm. And I would come every day at, at, at three o'clock and I would be washing glasses and ashtrays and cleaning the bar and wiping off the tables and sweeping the floor. And he would, man, he turned me on to Gratia, Long Carter the Third. He turned me on to Cecil Taylor. He turned me on to Archie Chef. He turned me on to Sun Ra. He turned me on to uh, 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 Abby Lincoln, but without Max, uh -huh. that, 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 that other Abby Lincoln, you, uh, Museka, mm. you, you know, and, and you know, man, and, and um, some of those kind of cats, man, uh, uh, Frank Wright and the, uh, that Frank Wright orchestra with uh, that kind of thing, and, and I was like, Wow, I say yeah, and Sam Rivers and all of that kind Ooh. of stuff, and Rashid Ali and all of that, because I've, I've always entered the top because that's what my father trained me to always enter. But I needed to the the the, uh, the be able to connect with the underground. So when you go and make a big payday, it's only a big payday if you got some smaller money coming in. Mm. So. Um, Every night would end, I didn't have to pay to get in the club. Now. Right. So every night, Freddie, uh, uh, when Freddie came for his week, I, I'd already memorized the book. I got the book. And I'm standing there and I'm studying him. And I, I watched him from Tuesday to Saturday. They closed on on Sunday, every night I, I I came at different times. I catch a first set, I catch a third set, I catch a second set, just to see what's happening at different times. And I was just standing in the back of the club, and I studied Freddie's ways and habits mm -hmm. because my father told me if a horn player stand when he's not so on on the or the piano side, he's depending on changes. If he stand near the crook of the bass, he uh, he depending on the root of the card, like most singers do. Mm. And he said, and if he's standing on the hi-hat side, he was influenced by the drummer. So I already knew he came from Art Blake. I already knew that, but I didn't know how he heard what he listened for to judge his thing. Uh. So I, I saw he was standing on the hi-hat side. I said, okay, I got him. So he's influenced by the drums. So the Sunday night after he finished, I approached him and I knew he's going to only give me five minutes. See, the one of opportunity is five minutes. Mm. I don't care who you're dealing with. It's five minutes. Just like keep if, if somebody run up on you in five minutes, you have made a decision. Yeah. True. <laughs> True. True. <laughs> right. True. So, so I just feel everybody else is that way, you know. So uh, I ran up on him big because I had been studying his ways and habits. I didn't know anything about him. I'm just observing from afar. So I walked up to him and I say, Freddie Hubbard, uh, my name is Michael Carvin. He said, hey, yeah, uh, how you doing? I said, look, if you want to sound good in the future, you should hire me. He said, what? And I turned around and walked out of the club. Okay. Hmm. I just moved from L.A. to San Francisco. I knew he was going to Howard Rums at Lighthouse the next week. When he left that, that Tuesday, I caught the 12th, uh, that uh, red eye, 
During that time, it was $12 round trip from San Francisco to LA. I flew back down. I stayed with a partner of mine. I was at the lighthouse every night. I did the same thing. Sunday came around. I walked up to him. I said, hey, Freddie Hubbard, I'm Michael Carvin. Freddie say, what you doing? You following me or something? <laughs> you know, I said, look, man, if you want to sound good, you should hire me. He said, wait a minute. He said, either you crazy or you can pull it off. I said, you have to pay to find out. Mm. Here's my number. And I left. Wow. Three weeks later, he called me. I flew to New York on a Sunday. I stayed with Hub and Barbara and um, Dwayne, Freddie's son, and we went and got our haircuts, uh, Freddie and, and Dwayne and I on Monday. We opened up at the Vanguard on Tuesday night, no rehearsal. Everybody was on the bench. You know that bench, bench Keith. Mm-hmm. And I'm planning there like, oh, oh, I'm not going to count any names, but it was six of them. And they're well known and they are. But the one thing that they didn't understand about me, first of all, I'm from Texas. Second of all, I'm a Vietnam veteran. Third of all, I'm second generation drummer. And I can care less about all that. You watching me play. Mm -hmm. I'm walking with the check tonight. So you can moan and groan and roll your eye. I ain't got nothing to do with that junior high school shit. Right. You know. So we went in the... uh, the dressing room at the Vanguard <laughs> in between French fries and hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> that turned me. Hey, hey T. Yeah. T. <laughs> Wait a minute now. Wait a minute, T. I'm Wait. coming from Las Vegas. I'm coming from Harris and Caesar's Palace and the green rooms and you know, uh-huh. you know, you, you know and, and we say, well, here's the dressing room. And, and during that time, the kitchen was, was, was operating. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, really? This is... I mean, look, man, I kept asking God, is this is the same club training all them people? <laughs> you too, right? When you got to New York, right? Yes, yes. Right, when you yes. first got... You yes. mean because it's, it, it's so the... Us Texas guys yeah. get to New York. We go out to the Vanguard. You, you know the van is. And, and man, I'm, I'm I'm trying to figure it out while while dodging French fries. And I love the chef because he was crazy. He wow. would say, Michael, what why why all these people eat French fries? I say, I don't know, man. He says always disturbing. You know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so uh, we're in the dressing room for our listening audience with. Uh-huh. And so Freddie said, man, he said, how you know my music? I said, I told you if you wanted to sound good to hire me. And I never let him off the hook. Mm. Every time he would say something to me, I would tell him, I told you. Mm. Because he was my ticket. And I had to get that gig. I had to get that gig. That's why with uh, the Michael Carvin School of Drumming students, I made all of their dreams come true. All they have to, I always tell them when I first start teaching them, who do you want to play with after you finish studying with me? And after they tell me that they've all joined those bands, because that's all you have to do. Yeah. But uh, the New York experience <clears throat> was very beautiful. I got a chance to meet you. Oh. You know? So that uh, that was very beautiful, man. I got a chance to meet my beautiful bride of of, of thirty five years. You know, yes, sir. <laughs> Michael. I'll never forget the first time we met. I'm not sure if you remember this, but I think it was I just got to New York to go to the new school, and um, I was walking uh, with Wes Anderson, and we were headed towards Roberto's, and I think you were leaving. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, he introduced us, and um, I'll never forget you. You laid a quick thing on me. You said, "Listen, Texas, don't let the pace of New York 
disrupt what you do. If you went running every morning, whatever that thing is that you do, do not let New York affect what you do. And I've always remembered that. Yeah. And I thank you for that. Yeah, you know, because see, it's powerful. It's powerful. New York is powerful. Let's face it. New York is powerful, man. Mm -hmm. And when when we come through there, let me tell you this story, man. This is a true story. So we get back from Europe with Freddie Hubbard. I have to find a place to stay, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So I stay at the Wellington Hotel, the most famous hotel in the world. It's the Wellington Hotel, right around the corner from <laughs> Carnegie Hall, 50, between 56th and 57th Street and 7th Avenue, the Wellington. Mm-hmm. I'm residing at the Wellington. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that morning, so that morning, Keith, I'm going to have some lunch. Morning for me was like 1 p.m. in the afternoon. So there's the what? The Carnegie Deli. It's right across the street. So I said, wow, Carnegie Hall Deli. And it's packed. It's packed. With the who's who pictures on the wall and all that stuff. Jackie Gleason and everybody. Mm -hmm. Johnny Carson. So it's packed and I'm standing there and I'm waiting and, and the guy's working. He's making his sound. Just, you, you live in New York. You know the deal. You've been in the New York deli during lunchtime. So he turned and say, next. And I say, um, let me have a pastrami sandwich on rye bread with uh, mayo and American cheese. He say, what are you, a fucking comedian? He say, get the fuck out of here. So I turned around and walked out. So that was a sign across the street said liquor. So I went across the street. I say, I want to get a six pack of beer. The guy said, what are you, a fucking comedian? This is a liquor store. I said, yeah, I want a six pack of beer. He said, get the fuck out of here. You know? So I left. So I, I called my father. In Houston, and I say, Dada, I don't, I don't know about this New York place. I say, everybody's cursing me out. I, I, I don't get it. Then after I've been there or after you've been there for a couple of years, then you see a guy, hey, man, how you been? How you doing? Get the fuck out of here, man. What? <laughs> Look out, man. So that same language, when it's translated mm-hmm. through an East Coast slang, it means how you doing? But it, it, you know that edge when he's working and he turn around and he say next and you say yep. yeah he say what do you want what do you want right right mm-hmm. like I got a gun on him or something right. what, what do you what do you want <laughs> I said well give me another strawberry on mail and don't move Total New York. okay what are you a comedian or... yeah. right right wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, but uh, but but you know, and then uh, I, I I came back. I was living on 103rd Street uh, in Amsterdam, and I'd gone to Europe with with Jackie. I came back as soon as I walked in my apartment with the real the real tape recorder. I hit the button, and and it's Pharaoh. He said, "Hey, hey, Mike, uh, uh, I'm gonna send you out a ticket. I want you to fly to LA and meet me." And that's when we did uh, the gathering at uh, the Ash Grove in L.A., mm. 1974, no, 1975 or 76. So I'm talking to my super. I'm from Texas. He said, hey, Calvin, how you doing? I said, hey, man, how you doing? He said, so what's that? I said, I just got back from Europe with Jackie McLean. He said, oh, yeah. I said, yeah. And I'm leaving tomorrow to go to fly to L.A. and I'll be gone for three weeks working with Pharaoh Sanders. He said, that's fantastic. And I just bought a Euro, the German, real to real. Remember mm. that? that hey, wow. I hadn't taken it out of the box. Mm. I hadn't taken it out the box. And that was my dream to go to Germany, Germany and get that because I was going to start recording. I just bought a burgundy leather two piece sport jacket with the uh, the hanky pocket. Mm-hmm. Just bought it. I wore it one time when I tried it on. Put that in the closet. I split. 
<laughs> so when I came back, whoever broke in the place, they sat down and cooked all the food I had in the fridge and ate it. They they tried my clothes on because they had everything on the bed and wow. all the shoes out and all the drawers open. So I called the police and the police came <laughs> and they looking and they said, um, well, it wasn't a fourth century, so who did you give your key to? I said, I didn't give my key to anybody. They said, well, you must have given it to somebody. So the landlord had put my Fisher turntable, but he put the speakers in the window facing out, and on the back, I had spray painted carbon. You can see it from the sidewalk. So I showed a cop, that's my last name. Those are my speakers. He said, Well, do you have a receipt? Wow. And I told him, Okay, because that Texas thing started brewing inside of me. That trespassing thing, because mm -hmm. you know how uh, what we'll do if we really carry that out, right? So I yes, felt sir. that I, I felt that coming on me. So I told the officer, I said it's fine. I went upstairs and I told New York City, you will pay me ten times for what just happened. New York City paid me a hundred times mm -hmm. for what happened. So I love New York. <laughs> Brilliant. Wow. Wow. Man. Michael, let me ask you about your passion for teaching. And, oh, man. You and, know, man. Uh, that each one teach one, right? Mm hmm Well, my father taught me. Yeah. That was, the, that was the only teacher that I had. So it's just like um, uh, guys would say, man, you're really a great teacher. And I say, yeah, well, thank you and all of that. But like I tell them, look, I only know how to teach the way I was taught. Mm -hmm. I just happened to be taught by my father who happened to love me. Mm -hmm. So that's who's teaching you. Michael right. Carvin is not teaching you. Henry Carvin is teaching you. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's, that, uh, that's just the way I see it. Like, it breaks my heart. Like, like, like I tell all of the students when they come, I say, look, let's get one thing straight. This is your last musical stop. Mm. I say, after this stop, you will become successful or you, I'm going to put you out. You see, it's, an, it's impossible for you to study with me and not be successful because I'm not going to keep it from you. I'm going to, I want you to have it. It wasn't kept from me. I want you to have it. I want your dream to come true. Why? That put more great drummers in the street. And what does that mean? The more great drummers there are walking in this world, the more or the greater all bands will be. You know, look, 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 you, you, you know, for fact, Keith, you can't take yourself where you're going, man, musically. That's why every time, for some reason, when we would uh, uh, hit, um, um, uh, what's that club, the Japanese club on the east side? Oh, um, the Katano. Yeah, you notice every time we would hit there, all of us would take all of us somewhere else. That's true. Every time, I don't care. It, it, I don't know what's going, going on over there, and I don't want to know. I just love it. You know, so so uh, uh, Train couldn't take Train where uh, where he was going because how do you force yourself to, to get outside of yourself? You can't take yourself outside of yourself, mm. but if you have a drummer that is relentless, that really dig you, then he's going to study you and he's going to push you and push you and push you and push you and push you. You can't resist that. Right. You know, you, you could hear Train when he was with Miles. He was flirting with it. He was. You could hear he was mm -hmm. flirting with it. Mm -hmm. But he was after. 
you go and hear Elvin before train. You could hear him flirting with it with uh, uh, Khalid Yassin, uh, Yassin, Larry Young, and Grant Green. Remember that band they had for a long time? Or a lot of that, well, well, he started working with, with Wayne. Wayne started using them on records after he had connected with his uh, his rolling in rhythm is what I call Elvin mm. uh, style of players. Rolling in rhythm be, because he just... He's just rolling down the hill and everything that is within his path becomes in his rhythm. Mm. You wow. know? Yeah. Great put it. Yeah. Great way to put it. Yeah. 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 Well, he, he, he just rolling in rhythm. But uh, I just want to let you know, I'm kind of upset with you now because this is coffee now. I'm watching you. Uh <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I mean, we still friends, but I'm, I'm, I'm just watching you now. You see, because I went out and bought the coffee. I was uh, in a shop in uh, Hollywood and I said, look, I'm doing Keith, I'm doing Keith Loft this show. Okay. And the guy say, you doing Keith Loft this show? I say, yeah. In uh, uh, New Jersey. He's in New Jersey. I say, look, now I don't even drink coffee, but he sent the shirt and he told me get a coffee cup and you know, it's kind of like doing a wedding. You got to wear a tuxedo and wear this kind of shirt and that kind of shirt and, and some patent leather shoes. I don't own no patent leather shoes. Well, buy some if you're going to be in the wedding. <laughs> so I say, give me the coffee that Mr. Loft is, if I call the name of it, he would say, oh, well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> You're all right. I mean, you, you, you I, I was a little concerned about you when I first mentioned the show to you, but so you went and did some homework, and I said, yeah, man, I said, this is very important. I, uh, I got the outfit and the mail, and, and you, you know, I got the, I, I bought the cup, and it, it, and he told me, don't have no writing on it. I ain't doing no commercial for nobody. Don't be coming in here with no, I love Lucy and stuff on the cup. So, and and then I did all that, and you drinking tea. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I, like I told you, I had. You know, I, I, was, I, 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 I started it, it, off you, with the coffee. No, no, you know me. You know me. <laughs> you know me. You already know that wasn't gonna get it. You, you, oh, man. you know me. You know me. Did you? You be like with your drum and your band, and he be talking about. Well, I started off with the brushes. You said, look, man, I'm up here raising lightning and thunder. Why you, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I started off with the brushes. Yeah, but that, <laughs> we ain't there now. <laughs> oh, man. You know, oh, boy. The drummer be leaving and say, wow, man, wow, wow, that keep love this kind of rough, man. I made a brush with him. He didn't even give me a T-shirt. You, you, you know, he, oh man! He gave Carvin a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> man, man, <laughs> Michael, I gotta yeah. ask you. I gotta ask you this: How did you start playing golf? I mean, were you introduced, or was it oh, passion man. that you? I look mean, at that you, look at here, man! Woo. Look at here. Okay, first of all. We have to go back to 1968, right? Okay. I have the opening act with Bill Cosby. Wow. Okay. And I had the opening act with Cos for about two years, but we would only work Harris and uh, Caesar's Palace and uh, some East Coast of uh, upstate New York college kids. So in between him shooting his TV show, this in the 60s now, we would do about five dates a year, you know? Mm. So we doing this date and he is saying, you know, I just don't understand how, you know, the guy, he pulls the club out of the bag and, and he hits this little white ball and he really hit it a long way. And then he walk and get it. He said, I think this is ridiculous. So he brainwashed me. <laughs> mm. The joke brainwashed me. You, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I'm thinking it's ridiculous. Because I'm still trying to get, get to the single paradigm. I was about 25. So, you, you, you know, I'm trying to get to the single paradigm. I say, well, I guess I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so 
Um, I married my beautiful bride and uh, her parents had um, a year round house in the Hamptons in uh, Sack Harbor. So one day we, we, we out there hanging uh, with her family. So Harold, her father, he's a, he was a lawyer and uh, very articulate man, well-dressed Brooks Brothers to the uh, mm -hmm. Brooks Brothers forever, Paisley, Pinstripe, you know. So uh, he said, well, uh, come on, uh, Michael. Uh, they call Run to Ronnie. Come on, Michael and Ronnie. We're going to go to the golf course. So we went to uh, Sag Harbor Country Club. It was uh, there. So mm. he was hitting some balls. And of course, he's teaching his beautiful daughter. And they hitting balls. So Harold said, Michael, why don't you try it? And I'm like, man, I don't. Sure. Then, I'm married to you. Guess I'll get the ball. <laughs> Not really impressed with this. So only see the, uh, I don't know what it is with me, but for, for some reason I can do things that nobody else can do, even if it's ridiculous. Mm. So it's packed there and, and and they have the driving range where the balls go in this direction. So they have uh, chairs and, and tables where people can have soft drinks. Well, you you know, you hit a couple of balls, you sit down and chat. So I I got up there and 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 Harold told me, okay, boom, 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 beep, beep, bing. I swung forward, I hit the ball. That they you you stand inside uh, almost like uh, when you uh, baffles like when you baffle off a guy in the studio. Mm. And so you stand in that little area. So I hit the ball. Uh, I swung forward, okay? <laughs> then I was in this pinball machine. My golf ball. <laughs> <laughs> my golf ball hit something. And the ball, as I'm in this pinball machine, wow. with the ball I just hit, then it goes backwards. And people are dodging oh, and man. ducking and... <laughs> So I was like, yeah, well, well <laughs> you, you should put it down. <laughs> he said, thank you. He said, he said come on, Roddy. You, you can't. Oh, man. I mean, so, uh, so, so we kept going, going out there. And then we, <laughs> we finally got into it. So, I was like 49 and somebody would have said, hey, man, when you get 50, you're going to get strung out with golf. So mm. I started feeling uh, New York started closing in on me. And then I felt Texas again. Mm. Wide open space, beautiful vegetation, you know, little critters running around. So... Rhonda fell in love with it, so I fell in love with it. So we got lucky as a couple that both of us really dug it. Mm. So um, we just started playing and 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 uh, being out on a golf course is breathtaking, man. I mean, as, as far as I'm concerned, then Tara Masahino. My my uh, Japanese buddy, we, we we start playing a lot, so we would go to the driving range all the time in New Jersey. Mm. So we kept playing and kept playing and kept playing and kept playing, and um, we just love it, man. You know, and and that's what uh, a lot of contacts on the golf course, sir. Yep. A lot of contacts. So we we just love it. And then Rhonda got her first hole in one in Lakewood Country Club in Long Beach, California. Then she got a second hole in one in uh, uh, Detroit. Mm. And as a matter of fact, she almost got a hole in one, her third hole in one yesterday. Everybody was hot and screaming, oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, nice. Everybody came up. Nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man, I've been, uh, I can't play golf and play drums at night mm. because my, 
I play drums with my smaller muscles and it take a while for my large muscles to relax uh. after playing golf. So we were in um, Memphis, Tennessee and uh, run to say, well, I, I want to play golf. She say, I, I know you can't play. I say, no. Nah. So I always caddy for her. Mm. So anytime a guy see a female golfer come in, the first thing they're like, <sighs> mm. so we driving up to the tee box. So it's three guys because you have to play. Uh, uh, no, it, it was two guys because you have to play a play a foursome. And there are no spectators on the golf course, so I have to have a golf bag just in case if I get hit, I will have the insurance from the golf course. Uh, so I drive up in the guys uh, uh, in uh, the male tee box, which they should be, they are guys. So they tee off and then they say, okay, Michael, uh, you can hit now. I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just a caddy. I'm caddying for my beautiful bride. This is Rhonda. So they're like... Mm. So she hit the ball. After about the third hole, they tell me the same stuff that everybody tell me. Oh, is she going to be like this all day? I say, yeah, it's going to be straight down the middle all day. Yeah. Uh, then they start saying, yeah, well, she played boring golf. She just hit it straight down the middle. I say, yeah, she hit it straight down the middle. Keith, we finished about the fifth hole and turned around, these guys will help us. Mm. Rhonda ran them off the golf course. <laughs> wow. She, the little bitty woman. Wow. She, she, yeah. she just ran. They just, they, they didn't say goodbye. They, wow. they just left. Wow. Mm. Because she's going to put it down the middle. Yes, that's where it's going. Her next shot is down the middle. Her next shot is on the green. Her next shot is in the hole. Now she's in the next tee box. It's down the middle. So since they couldn't uh, put her down because she couldn't play, then they say, oh, well, she's just boring. This is like boring golf. I mean, you aren't getting your money's worth. Wow. You, you, you know all of those kind of little golf mm -hmm. kind of like things. But... Um, Hmm. She, um, she's my golf teacher. See, men think upper body strength. So when we go to the tee box, we look at some par four is is five hundred yards. Yeah, I'm gonna crush this five hundred yards. Yeah. You hit it and it's sliced, and you're in the woods, and you hmm. ain't gonna hit no ball five hundred yards. Right. Right. So we we were playing one day and I didn't check the yardage. So if we're in the middle of the fairway, I said, Rhonda, what's did you see the yardage? She said, I don't look at the yardage. Uh -huh. huh. Oh. When I stopped looking at the yardage, I started hitting the ball straight down the fairway. Wow. <laughs> Hmm. Another thing that she kind of turned me on to is play the hole backwards. Play the hole from the green to the tee box instead of the tee box to the green. Why? Hmm. Why? Why? Because the shot is the approach shot. The shot is the last shot you hit before the ball hit the green. Okay, all that teeing off, that don't mean nothing. Because golf is a game of recovery. Mm. As, as long as you're not OB, out of bounds, you're going to hit it again. Just make this one better than you did the last one. That's all. But now the game is the approach shot to the green, the chipping and the putt. You drive for show, you putt for dough. Uh. So the chipping and the putting. So I started saying to myself, check this out. Figure out what club you can hit like a guy throwing darts. What is that yardage into the green? For me, that's 150 yards. 
Mm. 90 yards. Who practiced 90 yard shot, Keith? Who practiced 40 yard shots, Keith? Mm. That's why when you watch those pros, they hit the ball too far. So they are in front of the green with 20 yards left, but they walk away with a double bogey. They hit the ball one time and they 20 yards to the green and they had to hit it another four times to put it in the hole. They had to hit a ball four times wow. to get it to go 40 yards to get in the hole because guys don't practice that. So that's my brushwork. So I, I start approaching that like the drums. I, I, I had to have a picture. So driving is up-tempo. Bang, jig dang jig dang jig dang jig dang that approach side shot is a walking ballad. Boo, 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 boo. Uh, yeah, yeah, a little, uh, little, little something in the afternoon. Like, mm-hmm. like every time we, we played this tempo, I would turn to Jason and say, Sunday afternoon. Boo. Right, that's right. And then, you, you know, we say Sunday afternoon. See, we, we Sunday afternoon. And now you on the green, and now you just putting the lotion on your beautiful bride's back. At the beach, so you don't want to hurt anything. So you just smooth, getting it smooth. So you just want to hit that ball and let it roll. You don't want to hurt the ball. You just want to touch the ball and let it roll. So once I got into that concept, it helped me play better. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Man. Wow. Michael, you know what? Yeah. We're going to have to do a part two. I hope, I, I hope you. Say yes. No, I'm not saying yes. No. no. We ain't doing no part two. You must be out of your mind. I went and bought all this coffee, and, and you up here drinking tea, and now you saying, let me uh, um, uh, piss you off again. We go, no, I ain't, I ain't doing I got a haircut. I got the <laughs> mug. I, <laughs> of course, Keith. Of course. <laughs> Because, because you know what? But I'm gonna drink I, tea. I, the I, second I, time I'll go drink tea. Coffee or tea? I no, mean, I can read. I can yeah. read. No, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it says coffee with loftus. That's now, right. Come on now. And I, it, it even it, rhymed. It, tea with loftus doesn't ring no, no, a bell. No, 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 coffee no, no. with loftus. I like that. Da, 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 ah, da, da, a, little, yeah. a, a little theme song there. <laughs> Coffee with Loftus. <laughs> da 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 da. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Coffee with Loftus. Ba da. But he had tea. Ah. Da, da. <laughs> so, Coffee with Loftus. Boo, boo. Is for me. 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 Yeah. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> but but, but he, it, 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 it did. he said, but he had tea. <laughs> <laughs> Classy. <laughs> oh my goodness. Michael, okay, it's so good. We, seeing you. we on. We on. We good. Yeah. You know it's, that. It's 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 so good seeing you. And I thank you for coming on. And um, we'll definitely set up. Part two, because I want to ask more about Jackie Mac and that relationship. And um, oh yeah, oh you know what? And what? let's let's talk about um, what you have going on next with this new record that we discussed a while ago. Okay, we'll write that down. We'll, we'll write those questions down, and we we'll yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah, because uh, we'll do it after that. What, what? Whenever we have time, you just call me, and we'll set. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm gonna send my coffee. It says coffee. I'm, it said I'm gonna send my coffee with Lofty shirt to the cleaners tomorrow. My coffee with Lofty shirt. Coffee with Loftus. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, man. <laughs> All the best to you and the family. Tell your beautiful bride I said hi. Tell Rhonda it was good seeing her, and tell her hopefully um, we can um, maybe you know what maybe we can do we can do uh, Rhonda as well. Well, that's uh, I will mention it to her, but uh, you know now you you better uh, yeah. not be telling her you drinking tea. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I better come. I better come correct. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Michael, 
Let's hey. uh, let's talk soon, and we'll set it up. And thank you so much. And uh, oh, you great. more than welcome. And stay safe and okay. stay beautiful, which I know you will. And thank you so much, man. I appreciate oh, Michael, thank you, thank you. You oh, know, I love right, you. Man. I love you, man. I'll talk to you in a minute. Okay, now be safe. Okay. Bye, 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 bye. Be good.